Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Since the dawn of human history, we've gazed up at the stars in wonder, pondering our place in the vast expanse of the universe. Are we alone, or could there be other intelligences out there beyond the boundaries of our world? For decades, reports of unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial encounters have captured the public imagination, sparking fierce debate and endless speculation. And with each extraordinary UFO incident that gets recorded, it only adds another tantalizing piece to this cosmic puzzle. Our story begins in the summer of 1947, in the desert town of Roswell, New Mexico, when rancher Mac Brazel discovers strange debris scattered across his property. He unwittingly stumbles upon a mystery that will endure for generations. The initial headlines are sensational. RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. But no sooner does the story capture the public's attention than it is retracted, with officials claiming it was nothing more than a weather balloon. And so begins a decades-long battle between those seeking the truth and a government shrouded in secrecy. What really crashed in the New Mexico desert that fateful day? Fast forward to 1966 and another incredible event unfolds in West Hall, Australia. In broad daylight, over 200 students, teachers, and local residents watch in disbelief as a strange, saucer-shaped craft descends from the sky, hovers briefly, then darts away at incredible speed. Despite the numerous eyewitness accounts, the government dismisses the incident as a mere weather balloon. Sound familiar? The similarities to Roswell are undeniable, and once again the question lingers, what is being hidden from the public? The 1970s bring even more perplexing cases, like the Pascagoula abduction of 1973, where two Mississippi fishermen recount a harrowing tale of being taken aboard an alien spacecraft and subjected to disturbing medical examinations their story replete with strange, robot-like entities and inexplicable technology pushes the boundaries of reality. Are they telling the truth, or is it merely a fantastic tale spun by imaginative minds? Three years later, a similar narrative emerges from Allagash, Maine, where four men on a camping trip find themselves allegedly abducted by extraterrestrial beings. Coincidence? Or part of a larger pattern? But it's not just civilians who have encountered the unexplained. Military personnel, trained observers with access to cutting-edge technology, have also found themselves face-to-face -face with the extraordinary. Take the Tehran UFO incident of 1976, where Iranian Air Force pilots engaged in a dramatic chase with a luminous, unidentified object that seemed to toy with them, disabling their weapon systems and exhibiting capabilities far beyond any known aircraft. Or the Rendlesham Forest Incident of 1980, where U.S. Air Force personnel stationed in the U.K. investigated strange lights descending into the woods, only to find themselves confronted by a metallic, triangular craft of unknown origin. Perhaps most disturbing of all is the Cash Landrum Incident that same year, where three unsuspecting civilians suffered severe physical ailments after a nightmare encounter with a diamond-shaped UFO on a lonely Texas road. Their suffering and the government's apparent unwillingness to acknowledge the event raises chilling questions about the potential dangers of UFO contact and the lengths some will go to keep it under wraps. As we move into the modern era, the UFO enigma shows no signs of abating. The Belgian UFO wave of 1989 and 1990 presents some of the most compelling evidence to date, with thousands of witnesses, including police and military personnel, reporting sightings of huge, triangular craft moving at phenomenal speeds. Radar data confirms these accounts, revealing objects capable of physics-defying maneuvers that challenge our very understanding of what is technologically possible. 
Even more recent are the Phoenix Lights of 1997 and the Nimitz UFO encounter of 2004. Large-scale events involving mass sightings and military documentation that push the envelope of credibility. In Phoenix, a mile-wide V-shaped formation of lights cruises silently over the heads of astonished onlookers. In the case of the Nimitz encounter, Navy fighter pilots engage a tic-tac-shaped craft that vastly outperforms their state-of-the-art jets. These cases, backed by radar returns, video footage, and the testimony of highly trained personnel, cannot be easily dismissed. And so, we are left to wonder, what do these incidents, spanning decades and continents, truly represent? Are we being visited by extraterrestrial civilizations, as some fervently believe? Could these UFOs be the product of clandestine government projects hidden from public view? Or are they perhaps something else entirely, a phenomenon that defies our current understanding of reality? Though we may not yet have the answers, one thing is certain. With each new sighting, each tantalizing morsel of evidence, we are drawn deeper into a universe of possibilities and an ever-growing list of big questions. The cases I'll present to you tonight are just a few of the more famous samplings of strange and inexplicable incidents around the UFO phenomena. Perhaps someday the truth behind these unidentified encounters will be revealed. Until then, we keep watching the skies wondering what we might miss if we don't. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, in October 2023, Paranormality Magazine came out with a short article listing what they believed to be the top 10 UFO sightings of all time. It was a short article, just a page or so, mostly just a list, and not listed in any particular order, just the top 10 in their opinion but I thought it'd be fun to expand on each one of those entries and bring a fuller picture, and I've arranged them in order of year, from oldest to newest. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear my other podcasts, including Church of the Undead, and a sci-fi podcast called Auditory Anthology. Listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. In the summer of 1947, a curious incident in the small town of Roswell, New Mexico captivated the imaginations of people worldwide and gave rise to one of the most enduring UFO myths in American history. The Roswell Incident, as it came to be known, remains a seminal event in the lore of ufology, sparking debates, conspiracy theories, and a never-ending flow of speculation about extraterrestrial life and government cover-ups. Let's delve into the events that unfolded in 1947, the subsequent reactions, and the lasting impact on culture and conspiracy theories. The story began in early July 1947, when William Mac Brazel, a foreman working at the Foster Homestead, discovered strange debris scattered over a large area of the ranch located about 75 miles north of Roswell. The materials included metallic sticks foil reflectors, and other items that seemed unlike anything Brazel had ever seen. 
Curious about the origins of these materials, Brazel collected some of the debris and decided to report the finding to the local sheriff, George Wilcox, who in turn reported it to the Roswell Army Airfield RAAF, military involvement and initial response. The military quickly became involved, with intelligence officer Major Jesse Marcel being assigned to inspect and collect the debris. After an initial investigation, the RAAF issued a press release on July 8, 1947, stating that they had recovered a flying disc from a ranch near Roswell, a statement that immediately stirred massive media interest. The story was picked up by numerous newspapers, spreading the news of a possible UFO crash landing. However, this initial excitement was short-lived. The very next day, General Roger Ramey, the commander of the 8th Air Force at Fort Worth Army Airfield in Texas, held a press conference where he declared that the recovered object was merely a weather balloon, not a flying disc as earlier reported. To substantiate his claim, debris from the supposed weather balloon was shown to the press, effectively quelling the growing speculation about an alien spacecraft. The correction issued by General Ramey did little to dampen the public's interest in what had happened at Roswell. The initial report of a recovered flying disc had already fueled widespread speculation and excitement. Over the years, as the Cold War intensified, so did public interest in UFOs, which was further propelled by reports of sightings and claims of government cover-ups. In the 1970s, Interest in the Roswell incident was rekindled by ufologists and researchers who began to question the official explanations and sought out new evidence and testimonies from individuals purported to have been involved in the 1947 events. Books and documentaries on the subject proliferated, with claims that the debris was extraterrestrial in nature and that bodies of alien beings had been recovered from the crash site, only to be concealed by the government. The Roswell incident has profoundly influenced popular culture, inspiring a vast array of films, television shows, books, and a thriving tourism industry in Roswell. Each year, thousands of enthusiasts and the curious flock to Roswell to attend the UFO Festival, visit the UFO Museum, and explore the supposed crash sites. Furthermore, the incident has become a cornerstone of conspiracy theories concerning UFO cover-ups by the U.S. government. It has perpetuated a culture of mistrust and speculation regarding official accounts of unidentified flying objects and encounters with extraterrestrial life. In response to continued public pressure, the U.S. government conducted several investigations into the Roswell incident. The most notable of these was the Air Force's 1994 report titled, Case Closed, Final Report on the Roswell Crash. This report identified the debris found in 1947 as originating from a top-secret government project called Project Mogul, which involved high-altitude balloons designed to detect sound waves generated by Soviet atomic bomb tests. Despite official reports and investigations, the debate over what really happened at Roswell in 1947 continues to thrive. The Westall UFO encounter is one of the most intriguing and well-documented UFO sightings in Australian history. Occurring on April 6, 1966 in Westall, a suburb of Melbourne, Victoria, this event was witnessed by over 200 people, including students, teachers, and local residents, making it a significant case in the study of unidentified flying objects. On the morning of April 6, 1966, students and staff at Westall High School were going about their normal school day when a strange object was spotted in the sky. Described as being a gray, saucer-shaped craft, it appeared to descend, hover, and then land in a nearby open field known as the Grange. The object was observed for about 20 minutes in total. According to witnesses, the UFO was silent, moved erratically, and finally shot upwards at incredible speed, disappearing from view. The event was also noted for a secondary object that appeared to intercept or accompany the primary UFO. The students and teachers who witnessed the event were astounded by what they saw. Many described the object as having a smooth, metallic surface with no visible seams or markings. Some reported that the craft emitted a slight buzzing sound as it moved. After the object left, 
several students ventured into the field where it had been seen, finding circular patches or flattened grass. The incident drew immediate media attention, however the story was met with skepticism by the public and authorities. The Australian government and military initially dismissed the sightings as a weather balloon, while some local newspapers speculated about experimental aircraft. Over the years, several researchers and ufologists have investigated the West Hall incident. Shane Ryan, an academic, conducted extensive research into the event, interviewing many of the original witnesses for a project he titled West Hall 66, A Suburban UFO Mystery. His work culminated in a documentary that brought renewed attention to the case and prompted additional witnesses to come forward. The Westall UFO sighting has elicited a range of theories regarding its nature and origin. While some believe it was an experimental military aircraft, others assert it was of extraterrestrial origin. The lack of a concrete explanation and the dismissal by authorities at the time have fueled ongoing speculation and debate. The Westall UFO encounter remains a pivotal moment in Australia's UFO history due to the large number of credible witnesses and the persistent mystery surrounding the event. It continues to be a topic of interest and research within both the UFO community and among the general public. The Pascagoula abduction is one of the most intriguing and well-documented cases in the history of UFO encounters. It took place on the evening of October 11, 1973, involving two men, Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker, who reported being abducted by extraterrestrials while fishing on the Pascagoula River in Mississippi. Their encounter has become a cornerstone of UFO research, marked by its vivid details and the apparent credibility of the witnesses. Charles Hickson, 42, and Calvin Parker, 19, were co-workers at a shipyard who decided to go fishing after work at an abandoned shipyard pier. As they fished, they suddenly heard a whirring or whizzing sound saw blue lights, and observed an oval-shaped object with flashing lights hovering about 40 feet above the ground. The men described the craft as being about 30 feet across and 8 feet high. According to Hickson and Parker, three strange creatures with robotic, humanoid appearances and wrinkled skin emerged from the craft. These beings had no discernible eyes and a slit for a mouth and seemed to float above the ground. They took Hickson and Parker aboard the craft, where the men claimed they were examined for about 20 minutes before being returned to their original location. The men immediately contacted the local sheriff's office to report the incident. Skeptical but intrigued by the men's distressed state, the sheriff secretly recorded their conversation in a room left alone to catch them in a possible hoax. Instead, the recording captured Hickson and Parker discussing their encounter in great distress with Hickson even stating, Jesus Christ, God have mercy, I thought I'd been through enough hell on this earth and now I've got to go through something like this. The story quickly garnered national and international attention, with major media outlets reporting on the incident. The men underwent hypnosis and lie detector tests, which they passed, adding to the credibility of their account. UFO researchers including J. Allen Hynek and James Harder took an interest in the case and conducted further investigations. They found both witnesses to be credible and genuinely traumatized by their experience. Scientific examinations suggest that neither individual had fabricated the story and no conclusive evidence of a hoax was ever found. Despite the attention and some corroboration from additional witnesses who saw lights or unexplained aerial phenomena on the same night, skeptics questioned the veracity of the abduction claim. Critics pointed out possibilities of hallucinations or misinterpretations of natural phenomena, though no conclusive explanation has disproved the men's theory. The Pascagoula abduction remains a seminal case in the study of unidentified aerial phenomena and alien abduction reports. It stands out due to the immediate reporting, the emotional impact on the witnesses, and the extensive media coverage it received. The incident continues to be studied and referenced in discussions about human interactions with potential extraterrestrial beings. Up next, we move into the year 1976. 
beginning in the remote wilderness of Allagash, Maine, where four art students embarked on a camping trip that would forever change their lives. A story that included a glowing orb, a blinding light, and alien abduction. In 2025, neutron bombs wipe out much of the world's drinkable water. For the next several years, survivors exist in deplorable conditions and their rations are dwindling. One woman arises from the camp, determined to improve conditions. Charlotte is ready to do whatever it takes to ensure clean water for her fellow survivors. Water is almighty. Whoever controls the water rules the world. Can Charlotte prevent the power from falling into the wrong hands? Weird Darkness Publishing presents Working for H2O by Sarah Faith, now available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions on Amazon and at WeirdDarkness.com. The Allagash Abductions is a controversial and widely discussed case within ufology involving the alleged abduction of four men by a UFO in 1976. The incident took place in the remote wilderness of Allagash, Maine, and has since become a cornerstone of alien abduction lore, providing fodder for books, documentaries, and numerous UFO conferences. In August 1976, four art students twin brothers Jack and Jim Wiener, along with their friends Chuck Rack and Charlie Foltz, embarked on a camping trip in the Allagash Wilderness. One night while fishing on Eagle Lake, they noticed a bright glowing orb that seemed to be following them. To signal the object, Charlie Foltz decided to flash his flashlight towards it. The object then expanded and engulfed the group in a bright light. According to the men's later statements, the memories of what happened next were initially hazy. They recalled being back at their campsite in what seemed like an instant. The fire they had stoked into a large blaze before encountering the object had burnt down to embers, suggesting a significant amount of time had passed. The real story began to unfold several years later when the men started experiencing vivid nightmares all depicting scenes of being examined by non-human entities inside an unfamiliar craft. Seeking answers, they turned to hypnosis conducted by renowned UFO researcher and psychiatrist Dr. Raymond Fowler. These sessions purportedly revealed detailed accounts of their abductions, including descriptions of the beings as typical gray aliens which conducted various medical examinations on the abductees. The Allagash abductions caught the public's attention after the men went public with their story, bolstered by their hypnotic regression sessions. Their case was featured in books, television shows like Unsolved Mysteries, and numerous UFO-related conferences, turning the Allagash incident into one of the most cited cases in the alien abduction phenomenon. The case has had its share of skeptics, though. Critics argue that the hypnotic sessions might have implanted false memories or encouraged the men to fabricate the encounter subconsciously. The reliability of recovered memories, especially under hypnosis, has been a contentious topic in psychological circles. Furthermore, discrepancies in the men's accounts and motives for their financial gain through book sales and media appearances have also been points of contention. The Allagash abductions remain a polarizing topic among UFO enthusiasts and skeptics alike. Whether true evidence of extraterrestrial contact or a psychological and cultural phenomenon, the incident undeniably contributes to the ongoing dialogue regarding human interaction with potential extraterrestrial beings. The Tehran UFO incident is one of the most compelling cases in the study of unidentified flying objects, primarily because of the involvement of military personnel and the detailed documentation by government authorities. This incident occurred on September 19, also in 1976, over the skies of Tehran, Iran, 
and involves a series of strange aerial phenomena that were witnessed by both Iranian Air Force pilots and ground control personnel. The sequence of events began in the early hours when the Tehran Air Force Base received several calls from concerned citizens about a strange object in the sky. The base dispatched a Phantom F-4 jet to investigate. As the jet approached the object, the pilot reported seeing a bright light, which was much larger than a star. When the pilot attempted to close in on the object, he found that his aircraft's instrumentation and communication systems suddenly malfunctioned, prompting him to return to base. A second F-4 jet was then dispatched, and its pilot, El Parviz Jafari, also observed the bright object. Jafari reported that the object appeared to evade his aircraft with incredible speed and agility. During the encounter, a smaller object emerged from the larger light and headed straight towards Jafari's jet, prompting him to prepare to engage. However, as he attempted to fire a missile, his weapons control panel became inoperative. Both the pilots and ground control observed multiple phenomena during the incident. They reported seeing another smaller light released from the original object, which descended to the ground gently, illuminating a large area. After landing, a search team was sent to locate the object, but they found nothing, although they detected a strong beeping signal on radio scanners. The event was thoroughly documented by the Iranian Air Force and later reported to the United States via the U.S. Defense Attaché in Tehran. The detailed report was made public through a U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency DIA, document, which described the event as an outstanding report that was of high value to intelligence. The incident was also reviewed by several U.S. intelligence agencies, including the CIA, NSA, and State Department. Several theories have been proposed to explain the Tehran UFO incident, ranging from extraterrestrial spacecraft and secret military technology to atmospheric phenomena. However, none of these theories have been conclusively proven, and the incident remains unexplained. The malfunctioning of military hardware during the encounter particularly stands out, suggesting that the UFO had capabilities far beyond anything known at the time. The Tehran UFO incident remains one of the most well-documented and intriguing encounters in the history of UFO studies. The involvement of military aircraft, the subsequent failure of technology, and the detailed reports that followed make it a particularly compelling case for both believers and skeptics of UFO phenomena. The Cash Landrum incident is one of the most well-documented and perplexing UFO cases in U.S. UFO history. Occurring in the night of December 29, 1980, near Huffman, Texas, this incident involved intense physical effects, a lawsuit against the federal government, and unexplained phenomena that left lasting impacts on the witnesses. The event unfolded as Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's seven-year-old grandson, Colby Landrum, were driving home through the dense, piney woods of Texas. As they traveled down an isolated two-lane road, they encountered a large, diamond-shaped object emitting intense heat and light, which hovered above the road. The object, described as a huge, diamond-shaped object, was expelling flames and emitting significant heat. Unable to pass due to the heat and light, Betty Cash stopped the car, and they observed the object for approximately 20 minutes. During this time, both women exited the vehicle, while the child remained inside. As they watched, the object eventually ascended, accompanied by a group of helicopters which the witnesses claimed were CH-47 Chinooks, suggesting a possible military connection. The direct aftermath of the encounter was acute. All three witnesses suffered from symptoms consistent with ionizing radiation exposure or severe ultraviolet light overexposure. Betty Cash, who had spent the most time outside the car, suffered the worst. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, generalized weakness, and burns on her skin. Within days, her health deteriorated, leading to hair loss, skin lesions, and a lengthy stay in the hospital. Vicki and Colby Landrum also experienced similar but less severe symptoms. The investigation into the incident primarily involved civilian UFO investigators, with one of the most detailed examinations conducted by John Schusler, a NASA engineer and MUFON member. 
Despite attempts to obtain government records or recognition that military helicopters were involved, no conclusive evidence was provided by the U.S. government or military. Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum, facing mounting medical bills and ongoing health issues, filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government in 1982, claiming that the military had some involvement, given the presence of the helicopters during the incident. The lawsuit saw $20 million in damages, but was eventually dismissed in 1986 due to lack of evidence linking the government to the UFO and the helicopters. Theories about the Cash-Landrum incident range from top-secret military aircraft tests to extraterrestrial spacecraft. Some speculate that the object was part of a non-conventional propulsion experiment, possibly explaining the presence of military helicopters as part of an operational recovery or security detail. The Cash-Landrum incident is significant because of the physical effects suffered by the witnesses and the detailed documentation of their symptoms. It stands as a poignant example of how UFO encounters can intersect with human lives, leaving indelible marks on those involved. Later that year, in late December 1980, an incident occurred in the dense woods of Rendlesham Forest, Suffolk, England, that has since been dubbed Britain's Roswell. This event involved multiple sightings of unexplained lights and alleged landings of unidentified flying objects near Royal Air Force Base's RAF Bentwaters and RAF Woodbridge, which were being used by the United States Air Force at the time. The Rendlesham Forest incident remains one of the most well-documented and intriguing UFO events in military history. The events unfolded over three nights, starting on December 26, 1980. Military personnel from RAF Woodbridge observed strange lights descending into the forest. Thinking an aircraft might have crashed or made an emergency landing, they went to investigate. One of the servicemen, Staff Sergeant Jim Penniston, claimed to have encountered a structured metallic object. He described it as triangular, standing on three legs with hieroglyphic-like symbols on its surface. Penniston and others in the area reported the object rapidly accelerated away after they approached. The following night, Deputy Base Commander Lt. Col. Charles Halt led a team into the forest to investigate further. Halt recorded his observations on a handheld cassette recorder, which has since been widely circulated in the UFO community. His team observed a light that appeared to move through the trees, avoiding their attempts to get closer. Halt's group also reported seeing star-like lights that moved rapidly in sharp, angular movements and sent down beams of light into the base. In addition to visual sightings, Halt and his team detected unusual radiation levels with a Geiger counter at the supposed landing sites. These readings were significantly higher than the average background radiation, which added another layer of mystery to the incident. Skeptical viewpoints suggest that these sightings were misinterpretations of mundane phenomena. For example, the bright light seen by Halt and his team was possibly from a nearby lighthouse at Orford Ness which was visible from the forest. Others proposed that the initial sightings could have been caused by a meteor shower that was particularly active that night. In the wake of the incident, the UK Ministry of Defense MOD, determined that the event posed no threat to national security and decided that further investigation was unnecessary. This conclusion was unsatisfactory for many, leading to accusations of a cover-up. The incident has since become a significant case study in UFO research circles and continues to be a point of debate and discussion. The release of declassified documents, including Halt's memo to the UK Ministry of Defense and recordings made during the incident, has only fueled public interest and speculation. The Rendlesham Forest incident is regularly featured in documentaries and books discussing military encounters with UFOs. The Rendlesham Forest incident has been interpreted as a close encounter with extraterrestrial technology or as a series of misinterpreted natural phenomena, made more curious due to its involving military personnel. Between 1989 and 1990, Belgium became the epicenter of a significant UFO event known as the Belgian UFO Wave. This wave consisted of numerous reports of triangular UFOs spotted across the country, leading to widespread media attention scientific studies, and military involvement. It remains one of the most well-documented instances of UFO sightings due to the sheer volume of witnesses, including police officers and military personnel, 
and the detailed radar data collected during the incidents. The Belgian UFO wave began on November 29, 1989, when police officers patrolling the eastern part of Belgium observed a large, triangular UFO with bright lights illuminating its underside and red flashing lights on its edges. Over the next several months, an estimated 13,500 people reported seeing a similar object, with over 2,600 written statements collected by investigators. One of the most significant events occurred on the night of March 30, 1990. Multiple ground witnesses, including police crews, reported seeing a low-flying triangular UFO in various locations across Belgium. In response to these reports, the Belgian Air Force scrambled F-16 fighter jets to intercept and identify the object. The pilots managed to lock on to the target with their radar several times, but each lock-on lasted only a few seconds before the object changed position and speed dramatically, making interception impossible. The radar data, combined with visual confirmations, confirmed that the object was capable of moving at speeds and maneuvers beyond the capability of known aircraft technologies at the time. The Belgian Air Force later released a detailed report on the radar recordings which showed an object that could accelerate from 150 km per hour to 1,700 km per hour within seconds. The Belgian government took these sightings seriously, with the Belgian Air Force working openly with a group of civilian UFO researchers known as SOBEPS. SOBEPS conducted investigations and published two volumes on the UFO wave containing detailed reports, photographs, and analyses of the sightings. The general approach of the Belgian military and government was one of transparency, which was largely appreciated by the public and ufologists worldwide. The then head of the Belgian Air Force, Colonel, Colonel Wilfried de Brouwer, expressed his belief that the data clearly pointed to the presence of craft with far superior technology to any known earthly aircraft. Despite the compelling evidence and the number of witnesses, skeptics argue that the sightings could be attributed to misinterpretations of celestial phenomena like stars or planets or experimental aircraft. However, the detailed radar data and the maneuvers reported by experienced pilots make these explanations less convincing for many. The Belgian UFO wave stands out not only for the number of sightings but also for the level of official recognition and investigation it received. While no definitive explanation has been provided, the Belgian UFO wave continues to be a benchmark for UFO research and a case study in how governments can handle mass sighting incidents. When Weird Darkness returns, in the skies above Arizona, a series of extraordinary events unfolded on the evening of March 13, 1997, forever changing the landscape of UFO sightings. Witnessed by thousands and documented by many, silent, V-shaped craft glided over mesmerized onlookers. What were the Phoenix Lights? Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. On the evening of March 13, 1997, thousands of residents in the state of Arizona witnessed an extraordinary celestial phenomenon that would become known as the Phoenix Lights. 
This event is one of the most documented and significant UFO sightings in modern history. Unlike fleeting encounters that leave little evidence, the Phoenix Lights event was observed by countless people from various locations, making it a pivotal moment in the study of unidentified flying objects. The Phoenix Lights consisted of two distinct events. The first event occurred around 7.30 p.m., with people reporting a V-shaped object as large as a commercial aircraft gliding silently over the cities of Prescott and Phoenix. Witnesses described it as having multiple lights and moving at a slow pace in a steady trajectory heading southeast. Its large craft was observed by pilots, air traffic controllers, and military personnel who noted its size and unusual lighting pattern but could not identify it as any known aircraft. The second event occurred later that evening, around 10 p.m., when residents observed a series of stationary lights hovering over the Phoenix area. These lights formed patterns that lasted for several minutes before fading away. Many onlookers managed to capture video footage of these lights, sparking media coverage and adding to the growing intrigue around what was unfolding. The Phoenix lights quickly captured the attention of both local and national media, spurring debates and discussions about their origin. Theories ranged from military exercises to atmospheric conditions, but no definitive explanation was immediately forthcoming from authorities, which only fueled further speculation and conspiracy theories. The widespread nature of the sightings, along with the duration over which the lights were visible, challenged conventional explanations and left many to consider the possibility of extraterrestrial origin. Initially, there was no official explanation given by any branch of the government or military, However, as the intensity of the public's interest grew, authorities felt compelled to address the situation. Weeks after the incident, the U.S. Air Force claimed that the second event was attributable to flares dropped by A-10 Warhog aircraft that were on training exercises at the Barry Goldwater Range in southwest Arizona. This explanation, however, did not convincingly explain the first event involving the V-shaped object which remains unexplained to this day. The flare explanation was met with skepticism by many, including local government officials. Then-Phoenix Mayor Fife Symington, who initially played down the incident, later admitted to having witnessed the craft himself, describing it as otherworldly and not resembling any man-made object. His testimony, along with those from thousands of others, cast doubt on the official explanations and suggested that not all aspects of the incident were being fully disclosed. The Phoenix Lights had a profound impact on the public perception of UFO phenomena. It led to a surge in interest in extraterrestrial life and UFO research, influencing popular culture and the approach to UFO sightings. Documentaries, books, and films have since explored the incident from multiple angles, often highlighting it as a case study in government transparency and the serious consideration of UFO sightings. Moreover, the event prompted the formation of civilian groups dedicated to monitoring the skies for similar phenomena. It also influenced public officials to take a more open approach to the discussion of Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, or UAP. Today, the Phoenix Lights remains a topic of fascination and debate. For many who witnessed the events, and even those who later learned of them, the lights represent one of the most compelling pieces of evidence that there might be more to our universe than is currently understood. Whether a visitor from another world or a highly classified military experiment, the Phoenix Lights continue to be a fascinating subject for both the curious and the skeptical. The Nimitz UFO encounter of 2004 stands as one of the most well-documented and scrutinized events in the realm of unidentified aerial phenomena. Occurring in November 2004, the incident involved multiple radar visual encounters by United States Navy pilots from the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group. The events were captured on video and radar, leading to significant interest from the military, the media, and the public. The encounter took place approximately 100 miles southwest of San Diego, California, during a routine training mission. Pilots from the USS Nimitz and the USS Princeton, part of the Carrier Strike Group, were the first to report anomalous aerial objects. The Princeton had been tracking unusual radar readings for several days, noting objects that would descend from above 60,000 feet 
to approximately 50 feet above the water in a matter of seconds, then hover and abruptly dart away at speeds and directions far beyond the capability of existing aircraft technology. The most notable encounter was reported by Commander David Fravor, a pilot from the Nimitz. While on a flight training exercise, he was vectored to a radar spot by the Princeton. Upon reaching the location, he observed an object hovering above the ocean that appeared to be causing a disturbance in the water. This object, later described as tic-tac-shaped due to its elongated, capsule-like appearance, exhibited extraordinary aerodynamic capabilities. Fravor attempted to engage with the object, but it accelerated away from his jet with incredible speed and maneuverability. Following the initial encounter, other pilots were able to obtain infrared video of the object using their ATFLIR or Advanced Targeting Forward-Looking Infrared Pods. These videos, which were later leaked to the public, show an unidentified object moving rapidly across the ocean surface and then accelerating out of the frame with speeds unattainable by known aerial technology. The encounters prompted internal military investigations, but the details were not publicly acknowledged until December 2017, when the New York Times released an expose on the incident along with the declassified videos. This publication prompted the Pentagon to formally release the videos in 2020, confirming their authenticity and stating that the phenomena observed remain unidentified. The Nimitz encounter is significant for several reasons. It was captured on multiple sensor systems, observed by highly credible military personnel, and involved aircraft equipped with the most advanced tracking technologies. The incident has played a crucial role in changing the conversation within the U.S. government regarding UFOs, leading to the establishment of the UAP Task Force in August of 2020. The Nimitz UFO encounter not only provides compelling visual evidence of unidentified aerial objects, but also challenges our understanding of physics and aviation. The ongoing investigations into these phenomena continue to raise questions about their origins and intentions, emphasizing the need for more sophisticated tracking and analysis technologies. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear more Weird Darkness episodes about UFOs, I've placed a link in the episode description which will take you to several on my website. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find my other podcasts including Church of the Undead and a sci-fi podcast, Auditory Anthology. Also on the site, you can visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, mugs, and other merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find the sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. And a final thought. Stop spending so much time asking if you should do something, and more time asking how you will do it. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.